Hello and welcome to the latest installment of our Divide Guide event series. Uh, my name is Aaron McClear. I'm the U.S. Chair of Public Affairs for Edelman, uh, and we have some illustrious guests that we'll introduce in a moment. But before we get started, I just want to give you all a little context of how this fits into our overall programming. Uh, this week uh, in the Divide Guide, uh, event series. Uh, we're focusing obviously on tech policy and how the, the both the federal election and also state elections uh, could affect uh, tech policy across the country uh, in what um, uh, will, will certainly be an unprecedented and probably a longer than expected uh, election season that we're in the midst of. Um, a few other things that we're doing uh, in addition to this event series that I just want to make sure you all are aware of. Um, we're doing these weekly events on tech policy and uh, and, and, and healthcare policy. Uh, we have another event on Thursday about a uh, prolonged and or contested election uh, that I think that we are increasingly uh, expecting to have. So, uh, so please tune in for, for those events so, um, uh, so you can learn about um, sort of how to navigate those issues. Um, and then we also have other products I wanna make sure that you are aware of. Uh, we have a series of insights uh, and analysis points of view that we're putting out there. Uh, and that's how different industries, whether it's tech or otherwise, uh, will be affected uh, by a Biden administration or another Trump administration or a Democratic controlled Senate. Uh, but again, also uh, where we see legislative bodies change hands and, and uh, new regulators across the country and how that's going to affect these different policies. So lots of those insights and analysis going out uh, on a daily basis and, and, and on our website. Uh, we also have a video series every week featuring uh, some of our political experts from uh, within Edelman. And um, when we have debates, uh, they chop it up about uh, what they saw and what they learned from the debates. Of course, this week we don't have one, uh, but we still will have our experts online to talk about the Supreme Court hearings and all the other things that are playing into the, uh, the election. Uh, all of this and more is captured in our weekly newsletter, The Divide Guide, which goes out each Friday afternoon. Uh, if you're not on that email list, please let us know. We'd love to add you so you can uh, capture all of these things that we're doing uh, to help uh, guide you through, uh, again, an unprecedented and probably a, a, a long uh, election season. Um, so uh, with that, I'd love to turn it over to my uh, colleague, uh, Anna uh, Sakerin, who is going to lead the, the panel today. Uh, for those who don't know, Anna uh, uh, is a, a recent addition uh, to Edelman. Uh, she runs uh, the tech sector for the East Coast in the U.S., and she came to us from IBM, uh, where she was on the AI ethics board and uh, developed and ran a lot of the AI programming there. And I'm sure that that will be a topic of, of discussion for our illustrious panel today, Anna. Thanks, Aaron. Hi, everyone. So our discussion today will center around three broad yet important topics uh, for technology companies to consider as we run up to the 2020 election uh, and beyond. The first area is going to be dedicated to a discussion around responsible automation and the role of technology companies in the U.S. government in advancing shared prosperity. The second area will focus on the importance of diversity and inclusion policies in driving business value for technology companies, especially the ones uh, that are developing and deploying AI and machine learning tools. And the third area where we will focus will be dedicated to a discussion around how tech companies can prepare for increases in nationalism and the associated geopolitical risk as it plays out around the world. So before we begin, I'd like to introduce our panel of experts. First, we have Marcus Casey, who is a non-resident fellow in the Economic Studies Program at Brookings, where he works on their initiative dedicated to studying automation in the middle class. Marcus is also an associate professor of economics at the University of Illinois at Chicago. Uh, next, we are joined by Harvey Anderson, who serves as a general counsel at HP, where he leads the worldwide global legal affairs team. And then we have Sean Heather, who is a Senior Vice President for International Regulatory Affairs at the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. And last, we are joined by our friend Kyle Daly, who is the Technology Editor for Axios, and he will provide important trends analysis across all three of the topic areas I described. So let's get started. Uh, for the first part of our hour together, I'm going to ask each of our panelists to give a three-minute overview of their point of view for their pre-assigned topic area, and then we'll dive in deeper on each topic with questions. You'll see at the bottom of your screen a Q&A. If you have any questions as we go, uh, feel free to place them in there. And um, when we get to the end, we will go through some of them. Marcus, can you kick things off with your point of view around automation and how we advance shared prosperity? Yes, um, thank you. Um, <clears throat> so the first thing I would sort of lead off with is that 
we need to make sure that we understand what automation is actually doing to labor markets and and the first thing to understand is is that automation replaces tasks not necessarily jobs and so even though we expect automation to become a more prominent aspect of labor markets right that we will we'll see more and more companies adopt these technologies um, to replace tasks that you that uh, are normally done by human labor and and the consequence of that of course will be that some people will have their jobs disrupted some people will have their jobs displaced and unfortunately uh, a lot of those jobs will be people who are already at the low end of the skill distribution or the, the wage distribution. And so um, any discussion of shared prosperity um, effectively has to start with how do we get those people into, you know, enjoying the, 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 the benefits of increased productivity due to this technology investment. And so the first thing I, I like to focus on is that for people who are already in the workforce, we need to get those people uh, effectively reskilled or reeducated. So if their jobs are displaced or they have the opportunity to take on new occupations or new jobs within the same companies that they work with or in the same industries, um, that they'll have the requisite skills that will complement these new uh, automated technologies. And so to do that, I think takes, you know, not only sort of providing and asking uh, private companies who are adopting these technologies to do so. It takes a robust uh, public-private partnership, i.e. we need that our federal government to step in and provide incentives, maybe even subsidize some of these companies to actually engage in some of this retraining of our existing workforce. Um, the second part of that also is, you know, we need to focus on our K through 12 and our college education, right? So there's gonna be newer cohorts of workers who are gonna enter the markets. And, um, you know, in, in what's well known is that for many of, uh, especially people who are not necessarily at the most elite and most cutting edge schools, uh, that they're uh, effectively receiving educations for a foregone past. And what we need to do is to start thinking early and it will take investments by uh, governments and whether they be local or, or federal government to make sure that curricula are updated so that newer cohorts when they enter the workforce will not be left behind um, with respect to these new technologies. Now, some of that could be through the formal education mechanism. Um, some of that could be through, you know, certification programs that are done in-house um, by companies. And also we see in, as some companies are restarting apprenticeship programs. And so I think those two things together um, are going to be key to maintaining shared prosperity. The third leg of that also is for um, the government to provide incentives for companies to actually invest in AI and automating technologies that actually enhance human productivity rather than replace human productivity. And so what I mean is, is that there are tech companies engaged in uh, um, putting forth all sorts of new technologies. And so they're gonna provide a menu of these tools to businesses that business can, businesses could then adopt and Im implement in their uh, production processes. And where the government can be helpful, public policy can be helpful, in particular is to provide incentives for these companies to adopt those technologies that can complement human labor rather than replace it. And so I think, you know, with reskilling and education, enhancing our education, looking forward to the future and pushing companies to uh, adopt AI and automating technologies that are complementary to human labor rather than replacing it, I think we can get ourselves into a position where a large part of the uh, population can share in the prosperity. And if, if for some reason that some of these um, workers are not able to, to join this new technologically driven future, then we need to pair that up, you know, given the accelerating changes in technology um, with a, a more robust social insurance system to allow um, 
these people the room and the flexibility to be able to feed their families, to actually uh, enjoy these technologically advances, technological advances, but at the same time be able to uh, retrain or um, <clears throat> or reskill and get into new positions. And so I think it, it's very important that you know that this occurs through this public private partnership or our uh, deals between the private sector and the public sector to ensure that everybody gets a chance to enjoy the prosperity that surely to come in a technologically driven future. Thank you, Marcus. That's wonderful. Harvey, can you provide your, provide your point of view on the importance of um, a robust diversity and inclusion policies and the link to driving business value for tech companies? Sure, sure. Uh, thank you, Anna. Uh, thanks, everyone. Um, Marcus, great. Great to hear, hear your point of view there. Um, I think this is going to uh, connect to where you left off on the AI side. But first and foremost, um, to, to the core thesis, is DNI important? It's absolutely important. We believe that DNI, uh, having a diverse team and a, and a diverse in many dimensions, by the way, so they're truly diverse um, by way of perspective, geography, um, uh, background, uh, real diversity creates better business decisions. And HP has long believed that um, we've had, I think we have probably the most diverse board in the, in the tech sector um, at the executive level. We have almost 46% uh, are minorities, 30% are women. Um, we can do better, but that, those are just two ways to, to define diversity. And I just wanna be really clear that when we think about diversity, we really do mean it in, I think, the, the capital D way. Um, but you get better decisions and you get, you get better business performance because more people bring different perspectives and you avoid the groupthink, you bring in different angles, you pressure test in different ways, and, and that's, that's essential. Um, you know, and we're not the only one that thinks that, certainly at the board level or at, at the company level. I mean, obviously there's a larger movement today. Um, California recently adopted AB 979, which, which, which requires that boards, public boards in California, actually start to bring in underrepresented communities on their boards. We were one of the leading companies behind that um, for the reason that we think that you get better decisions. And, and tying into the, to the AI piece that, that Marcus um, just kind of like opened up, like that's one example of where diversity kicks in. If you're developing and an, an deploying AI, AI is a function of what it's taught. And so it learns logic. So if you teach it one thing from one perspective, that's what it will replicate. So it, it learns what you teach it and it learns what you don't teach it. And I think there's a, you know, there's a whole plethora of information out there right now about what happens when AI is given sort of limited sets of data or data that has implicit bias already built into it. So it's, it's essential there. I think on the other side, on I think the other key point I want to make is when we say DE&I, let's talk about the I side, uh, the inclusiveness. So it's one thing to have a diverse group of people and to get them together. And then it's the second thing to get them to actually to work together and to be actually inclusive. And to the extent that uh, an organization really creates a sense of belonging, that's when you start to get people to participate. And, and that's where the value comes out. And so in our teams, we spend a lot of time just on the inclusive side of it. Like, what are the, what are the small behaviors that make people want to participate? What brings them out of the, out of the corners? How do you stop over, stepping on them or, or shutting them out? And, and it, can, it can be small things like how you amplify, who you amplify, amplify uh, not cutting people off, um, reaching out to the, to the quiet part, person in the corner to get his opinion or, or her opinion, the one that doesn't often speak. So, and addressing whatever microaggressions that might be in your culture. I mean, that's a legitimate thing too. So making a, a, an environment where you feel, where there's a sense of belonging, takes advantage of the diversity that you have. So it's one thing to have diversity, but if you don't feel included, what's the point? Because then you don't participate and you don't get the perspectives. So I'll, I think the only last thing I could say is that, um, today, the, the moment of this time period and, and the social justice movement in the United States has made this even more important. And I think that the, that the one of the core questions for, for enterprises is, 
it, what are the edges of the voice? Like, like, what does it mean to be a part of this social justice movement? How do you, how do you inculcate that into your business decisions and think about it, not just as, as D and I, but the E part, the equity part, like what, what different decisions do you, how do you deploy product? How do you allocate product? Um, what are the social, co the, the consequences of, of how you implement your business? That's a whole new frontier. Um, that I think this moment has has actually expanded that aperture and 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 the real challenges for organizations to start to move into that to to own some of that space that's it uh, amen harvey that's wonderful. Thank you very much so Sean, over to you uh, for your point of view on nationalism and preparing for the geopolitical shifts. I told you we were going to cover a lot of ground today. We are covering a lot of ground. Thank you, Anna, and appreciate Edelman for, for pulling this, this conversation together and for its series. Uh, tech nationalism is absolutely uh, on the rise. I think there are four uh, major factors that are uh, leading in, and driving uh, that uh, energy. Uh, first and foremost, uh, Silicon Valley is the envy uh, of the rest of the world. I think that's something that uh, has been around now for a decade or longer. Uh, you go uh, and sit in foreign capitals and uh, talk about uh, what is on their mind and their agenda. Uh, they want to know what's the secret sauce that has allowed the United States to produce not just Silicon Valley, but now other kind of tech hubs that exist around the United States. And, and they want to know what that policy prescription looks like. So uh, that's one underlying factor uh, in the rise of tech nationalism. Uh, the second is the need and relevance of technology. Uh, obviously, the COVID pandemic has accelerated probably 10 years of tech adoption uh, in the time of six months. Uh, but even before COVID came along, uh, the importance of thinking about technology and, and the need for governments to be at the commanding heights of an economy. Uh, if you think back 100 years ago, governments wanted to be at the commanding heights of, of things like uh, transportation and energy and these things, uh, while those things still are important, uh, governments want to be at the commanding heights of, of what is relevant for their economies going forward, which, which also leads to this kind of tech nationalism uh, sentiment. Third, uh, the rise of China. Uh, again, this is not a new story, uh, but for more than 10 years, member companies of the chamber uh, have been having to deal with the reality of Chinese industrial policy and the kind of trade-off uh, where if you want to have access to the Chinese market, you want to do business in China, uh, that they're going to expect you to do so in a way that, that helps facilitate some level of tech transfer. Uh, and so this has uh, given rise uh, to, to this uh, time uh, that we're in of tech nationalism. Uh, the fourth trend line I'll, I'll, I'll say is this is probably the newest uh, of, the, of, the, uh, of the four, and that is the interface between national security and technology. Um, and this is something that, uh, for example, we saw in the FIRMA debate where there's been conversations in the Congress and now with the new administration on how to update our CFIUS uh, and export controls process, CFIUS being the process by which we evaluate inbound investment in the United States. Um, that primary concern is that people are buying into technology uh, companies in a way that, that undermines our national security on the export control side, the ability to export technologies. Uh, we see developments now about concerns about underwater sea cables connecting the United States to Hong Kong um, and new cables that are being built and, and the concern associated with vulnerabilities as it relates to those cables. Uh, and obviously you, you have uh, issues around TikTok and data uh, and data governance uh, that are, are, are new today with a series of, of executive orders. So what does all this mean for the chamber and its members and, and how are they coping uh, with this rise of tech nationalism? I'd say that there are kind of three strategies uh, the companies uh, loosely align themselves with, uh, depending on the issue. Uh, one would be to get local. Uh, an example of that uh, may have seen in the news recently, Microsoft uh, announced that they are looking to make a significant investment in building out EU cloud capabilities uh, in Europe. Uh, I think in Greece, they announced that they plan to, uh, to build out and hire a lot of Greek uh, engineers to, to build cloud computing capacity in Europe. Uh, so get local is one strategy we see members taking. Uh, the second, I, I'll call some combination of hold on and hope uh, slash hold on and fight. Uh, I think there are companies that, you know, quite frankly, are hopeful that this somehow passes by and does not uh, eclipse them uh, and bring them into the fold and, and or uh, that somehow there's hope that there'll be some kind of kind of global resolution. And an example of this is uh, around digital service taxes, uh, this idea that was kicked off by France, but uh, now has, I think, you know, upwards of 40 plus countries that have at least had some thought about creating some kind of special tax for companies that do business outside of their 
country largely, but do a lot of sales into it and, and want to find a way to, to have a solution at the OECD versus a unilateral you know, approach uh, state by state. Um, and the third way I think that you see companies uh, trying to address this, and this is probably the newest, is, is get creative. Uh, and my example here is the recent uh, Schrems decision out of Europe uh, that has uh, concerns about data flowing from Europe to the United States over uh, U.S. Uh, surveillance practices and uh, questioning whether or not not just this instrument called Privacy Shield that allows 5,000 companies that are registered uh, to, to afford uh, comfort in their transfer of data, uh, but more broadly the question of standard contractual clauses, which far more uh, businesses rely on uh, for the volume of data that they move between the United States and Europe. And here, I think people are trying to get creative as to what is the policy solution to address uh, this rubric uh, that is in part uh, you know, built around this kind of concept of EU fundamental human right to privacy, but is also uh, certainly uh, against a backdrop of, of, of tech nationalism. Uh, the other example of Get Creative is what we're seeing with, with TikTok and various companies trying to find a way, uh, first with Microsoft, more recently with Oracle and, and Walmart and others, uh, trying to find a way to, to thread the needle uh, with the U.S. government and with the Chinese government in a way that, that allows uh, TikTok to, to continue to operate. So we see get local, hold on and hope, uh, and, and, and get creative as, as the three ways people are approaching these trend lines. Let me just wrap up and say, uh, in terms of kind of future casting the elections, because I know that's part of this conversation, uh, most of these trend lines, uh, Silicon Valley it being an envy, the need for, for technology and its relevance, China's industrial policy, and quite frankly, the national security and tech interface are things that I'm not sure changes dramatically whether we see a Trump uh, second administration or a Biden administration. I think many of these trend lines have been longstanding and have been building over time and, and either administration uh, is gonna have this uh, front and center and I suspect uh, both of them will, will, will struggle in terms of how, uh, how to respond. Uh, I, I will just add this, that I think quite frankly, the Congress and where the Congress goes may have more to say about these issues uh, than quite frankly, the next administration. And I say that because what happens at home matters abroad. Um, if we have a Congress that decides to move out aggressively uh, around data governance, around antitrust in the tech sector, uh, around AI uh, and the, the belief that we need legislation uh, to speak to AI, that will have far more motivating effect in what happens in foreign markets and capitals, uh, which are more prone to adopt uh, aggressive policies in this space. So uh, I think when we come to the other side of the election, we get a new Congress, uh, how we start talking about these issues within the United States will have a lot to be said about then what, how does the U.S. take its message abroad in these foreign capitals. Uh, and, and try to address uh, the rise of tech nationalism. So let me stop there and, and look forward to the conversation. Thanks, Sean, that's great. So Kyle, when you look across these three considerations, where are you drawn? And can you distill kind of a few high level trends um, to watch? Yeah, sure. So uh, I guess I have the unenviable task of talking about all three things in the same amount of time that uh, everybody else had to talk about each, but um, certainly, can, sort of be, be quick, but, um, you know, right now, obviously the big overhang is the election. Um, and, you know, Sean said something interesting, which is that, I mean, with respect to nationalism and sort of the balkanization of, um, of the internet, you, there are sort of broader trends that we're probably going to see either way. Um, I, I think in some respects that applies to all three, right? I mean, automation, um, we haven't seen a ton of attention from the Trump administration on this front. I think it was actually at an Axios event uh, in probably two months after Trump took office that Steve Mnuchin said, you know, look, we're not worried about this at all. This is like 50, 100 years down the road. We're, we're just not even thinking about this right now. Um, and there's been, you know, there's like the president's uh, annual economic report. There have been some mentions of it. Um, just sort of carrying on some estimates from the Obama administration. There's an expectation and awareness that there will be disruption, but there isn't really a clear policy infrastructure around doing something about it. Um, you know, Trump is, is very sort of focused on uh, a more traditional manufacturing jobs and ways to shore those back up and onshore those. Uh, but having said that, Biden hasn't really said much about this either. You know, I was just looking earlier today at, at uh, his campaign site, and I think they sort of have one sentence about 
uh, automation. You know, they, it's again, just sort of, we need to bring the jobs back. We need to have high paying manufacturing jobs. What that means when you sort of have the orthogonal line of automation, he's not really saying. So, you know, I, I think it's, it's something that is um, coming no matter what, as Marcus said, uh, it's gonna be, I think, weirder and harder to predict than than anyone's quite anticipating it's the estimate that i think the obama and trump administration have both put out is maybe about three million jobs uh at least in the semi near term affected in some way so that's either lost or seriously disrupted um you know we're talking about at least millions of people who are looking at not having a job or having a very different job and there isn't you know a major kind of voice um, saying, okay, here's what we need to do about that. And of course, right now, uh, we've got a much bigger jobs crisis that is created by COVID. So you sort of have to deal with what's right in front of you and then look to, to the looming crisis. So, you know, I, I think this is uh, sort of a broad sectoral trend that, that Marcus summed up quite well that um, is <laughs> coming towards us no matter who's in office. Uh, on DNI, and um, you know, Harvey alluded a bit to this too, but Silicon Valley, as well as big business more broadly, remain super white, super male. Um, you know, I, I think there is a, a genuine, sincere will to change that. Just as Harvey said, you know, there's a big body of research uh, that, you know, that A, it's, it's a problem in and of itself. But B, it's, it's bad for your business. It's bad for your product if you have... Um, people underrepresented in your company, you know, that, that have experienced systemic racism, systemic sexism, um, disenfranchisement, you know, you're not going to uh, bake fixes or at least attempted fixes to that into your products. And we've seen that, uh, you know, quite a bit. I mean, facial recognition to this day is far worse at recognizing faces of color. Um, and that's something that, you know, Democrats are more vocal about. Um, it's not clear that there's some major big government project uh, to to really address that. Um, I, so I think that's something that we're going to see, you know, change coming from the companies first. Uh, there are major initiatives to diversify the boardroom, to exert to, to diversify the executive suite, um, but that takes time too. You know, I mean, you have to sort of uh, focus on diversifying the, the pipeline. Um, so, you know, I, I think this is a long-term thing where uh, hopefully we're going to see a, a positive trend towards greater diversification and, you know, that we're in this interesting position where, um, you know, we can actually sort of pause and uh, pause progress and look at, okay, you know, we've had these inborn biases for centuries that we now have a chance to kind of step back and, and try and strip them out a bit from um, the, the products and services of the future. So, you know, whether that happens uh, really looks like it's, it's more up to the companies um, than Washington, for instance. Uh, on, on nationalism, I think Sean captured it well. You know, for a long time, we sort of uh, had these three competing models for how the internet and, and sort of technology broadly work. You've got the authoritarian model, sort of the China model, where you've got heavy surveillance, heavy state controls over what people can say, um, what they can access. And then you've got, uh, it's called the European model, where it's a lot more open, um, but very focused on privacy, right? And, and sort of maximizing um, individual rights on the internet. And then you had the fully open American model, sort of this laissez-faire thing where people can uh, go anywhere and do anything. Um, but really the maximal rights are sort of <laughs> across the board, which means corporations too. So there's sort of unfettered, uh, at least legal ability to, to collect data. Um, you know, we're in a weird time right now with that. Uh, uh, Trump has, has sort of um, upended that world order, um, with stuff like the would be TikTok and, and WeChat bans. Um, 
and you know we're we're starting to look a little bit closer to i mean i, I wouldn't say we're you know digital authoritarianism but th there's that sort of protectionate um instinct that did not really exist um and at the same time you know you've got sort of a bipartisan uh rising interest in curbing some of the powers of um tech companies and so you know that means potential privacy legislation that means potential anti antitrust action um so you know there there is an, an attempt to use the powers of the state to kind of uh, rein in tech companies um and that's something that i i think we will see again regardless of of who's in office i mean some of the the sharper edges stuff like the TikTok ban we wouldn't expect to see um biden attempt something similar necessarily but you know simple things like uh trying to blunt china's uh expansion into africa or you know as, as sean mentioned uh they own a lot of undersea cables and there's currently an effort underway to you know, convince companies and countries to not use china's cables um keeping Huawei and other Chinese gear out of out of US networks, that's all going to continue. And, you know, nationalism isn't going away either. I mean, it's, we're, it's not just the US. Uh, Modi's not going anywhere. Xi Jinping certainly isn't going anywhere. Putin isn't going anywhere. So, you know, I, I, I think we expect to, regardless of who's in office, continue to see this play out, this sort of balkanization and, and nationalism in weird ways that are going to be uh, interesting to watch. Yeah, that's great, Kyle. Thank you so much. All right. So with our remaining time together, um, if we could just switch to the panel view, we're going to start taking some questions. So you'll see at the bottom of your screen um, the q and I don't see any in there now. Emily, do you? No, we don't have any questions yet, but um, if folks would like to go ahead and submit, um, you can just click that Q&A box at the bottom of your screen and submit. Oh, great. Well, I have, I have a question for, um, for, I guess, for the group. Um, so, Marcus, I want to know your opinion on um, whether AI and automation is actually stealing people's jobs. And if it is or isn't, what type of technology, robotics, AI, um, kind of adds to the idea of replacement and then what adds to this idea of complementarity. And then to Kyle's point, um, the site, is there are 3 million, I guess, is that an agreed number? There's 3 million jobs in the U.S. that will be lost to automation? Well, there's all sorts of estimates all over the place. So I don't think there's an agreed number. I mean, it depends on what the model is that people are using to forecast these things, right? So whether it be 3 million, some estimates say 75% of some jobs will be affected. I mean, you know, I, I mean, I think we, we can't put a whole lot of stock in those sorts of things. I think what we need to focus on is, is that, you know, AI and automation aren't necessarily stealing jobs in that sense, right? You know, this is a natural progression. You look throughout history, there's always going to be adoption of new technologies, right? I mean, we can go back to when the car replaced the buggy and, and so on and so forth going, going forward, right? I think, you know, and, and in all these circumstances, there's always been fear that the next cohort of people or will not get a job again. And, and there's always been jobs, right? We've continued to grow and prosper as a nation. So, I, I'm less concerned with the idea that that necessarily that AI or automation is stealing jobs. I'm more concerned about thinking, what do we do for people whose lives are disrupted by the adoption of AI and, and, and these other technologies, right? And I think that the accelerating nature of technological adoption makes that much more crucial to think about now than it was, say, 30, 40 years ago, right? So. Um, you know, now you can put in, you know, the technology and you can get it up and running in, in a year and you need, you know, maybe three employees when you used to need 20 in the production process, right? And so how do we think about making sure, because 
when these new technologies are adopted, there's going to be new jobs that are created, new tasks that are created. How do we get people in a position to be able to fill those positions? And, and, and that's why, where I, why you know, we need to focus less on the issue of jobs being stolen by technology and more on, you know, let's get people in the places they need to be faster than we did in the past. Mute it. Sorry, we have some questions coming in. Um, so an anonymous attendee says, no matter the election results, how likely do you think we'll see increased public awareness of privacy concerns and associated legislation within the next year? And I think to add on this, this, this conversation around what is data, Sean? Maybe this one is for you. Is it an extension of our personhood or human rights or is it a commodity um, that we give away for our free services? Well, I think um, after the elections, the likelihood that we will have a federal privacy law um, goes up uh, somewhat. I think the biggest driver is uh, less the election and more what happens uh, with the state laws and the fact that California's uh, privacy legislation uh, goes uh, live. Uh, I think what uh, the chamber's members are most concerned about is having a patchwork of 50 state privacy laws uh, and for those companies who do business abroad, uh, having to layer that on top of all the different jurisdictions in which they operate. And so I, I do think that the, uh, the pressure goes up uh, for uh, creating a, a, a federal privacy uh, law. Uh, that being said, uh, with the California law in place and in effect, uh, that I think somewhat begins to create a floor uh, for a conversation. Um, and where it goes from there, uh, colleagues at the chamber who do the domestic privacy work might, might give more of a, of a thought process. Um, where I think data governance is headed is, is actually more interestingly not in the context of data that you and I have uh, that we give to companies uh, freely. I think it actually is in the non-personal data space. Uh, what we see happening uh, in foreign jurisdictions is now that most jurisdictions have moved and put some kind of privacy regime in place uh, following the EU's uh, implementation of GDPR is now countries are circling back and saying, what should we be doing about data that companies are collecting that has nothing to do with people, but has to do with maybe data they're getting from sensors and other kinds of things. And what you're seeing now is this idea that we need to move to create data pools uh, that uh, companies would contribute their data sets into a pool uh, in an effort to create more innovations, to create more competition, uh, and to allow more players to have access uh, to data sets. Um, this, I think, is uh, interesting if it's done in a voluntary manner, uh, but if you start compelling companies to kind of share their data sets, uh, you're essentially, you know, kind of creating a world where you're, you know, compulsory sharing of, of essentially trade secrets. Uh, companies invest a lot of money uh, into uh, their systems and systems management that generates all kinds of data that has nothing to do with who I am and what my shopping habits are or what I browse on the internet. Um, and I really think that the next stage of conversation around data governance around the world uh, is actually moving outside of the privacy lane and into a broader context of, of non-personal data uh, and, and what kind of access rights and permissions need to be granted between companies. I think that's the, the next data governance fight, at least, that we're thinking about here at the Chamber. Thank you. And, uh, Anna, do you mind if I jump in? Just oh, please, to, anyone. Yes, it's a great. So, um, I, yeah, I, I just wanted to address the, um, you know, the actual question of like the likeliness of privacy legislation. Um, I think, you know, I don't know uh, if sort of the the non uh, tech policy wonk public realizes that you know we got really close to a federal privacy bill. Um, this past year, I mean, really it's 2019, um, there was bipartisan, bicameral agreement that, you know, we want something. And surprisingly, there was, you know, pretty solid bipartisan agreement on principles. Um, you know, there were some, like, some Democrats wanted to create an entirely new agency for policing privacy. Uh, I don't think any Republicans wanted to do that. You know, there, there were definitely some small sticking points, but they really kind of got snarled up around, it was really just two things. It was preempting state laws, um, like 
California, as Sean was just talking about. Um, well, I shouldn't say like California, that's really the, the only <laughs> significant uh, sort of comprehensive state privacy law. But that's sort of the model, the test bed that you know, we'd expect to see probably some other states um, take up. And, and other states have indeed moved similar bills through you know, their various states, I think, or in uh, legislative process. Um, and then also private right of action. So your right as a consumer to sue companies uh, directly instead of you know, state prosecutors taking that on. Uh, so that was something Democrats wanted, Republicans didn't. And other than that, I mean, we sort of really had the broad contours of legislation and it just didn't happen. So, you know, I, I think, um, I mean, everybody agreed, hey, if this is going to happen, it's going to happen this year. We've got the CCPA, the California bill looming. That's about to take effect. Started next year. We got to get this done. It didn't happen. You know, I mean, if you predict anything's going to happen in Washington, odds are better than not that you're going to be wrong. But nevertheless, you know, I, I think the odds of, of a federal privacy bill actually moving might be better than, you know, you, you might expect. Great. Harvey, do you any, have anything to add to that? Yeah, it, that's interesting. Um, it's a great question. I was the chief privacy officer for a long time at Mozilla and did a, uh, I would say we were in a private, privacy forward spot. And I always thought there was gonna be a privacy bill um, just around the corner um, every time. And so uh, also uh, on the California bill, which is landmark legislation. I mean, it, it was, it's, that is a, a huge piece of, of legislation and from a consumer perspective, it got watered down a lot from a, a pro privacy perspective I'll, I'll have to say that and i think you might see in california another shot at trying to strengthen that to come back and strengthen um kind of fill in the gaps so to speak which i think will create more dispute i mean that was a pretty interesting process of how we even got that bill here in california um i think kyle's observation about um about washington and the fact that it almost happened is in some ways a sad testament to what bipartisanship looks like. It was like one of the few things that everyone could agree on because no one really paid the price except the tech companies. And I mean, if, if it tied in with tech lash, if you think about it, um, you know, who was going to bear the cost of that, uh, so to speak. And then uh, I think uh, Sean's point about the data governance is really uh, insightful. And what we're seeing is uh, data being weaponized, data governance structures being weaponized at the na nation state level. And, and by that, I mean, to the extent you create regimes that require you to keep your data and manage data flows and transfers out of your country, put aside privacy, you're driving, it's a nationalist policy, you're driving cloud services and, and you're, you're promoting the national and local companies by doing that, um, which essentially is a, is a barrier to competition and changes the way you even design products. So now you have to have two designs of products, so to speak. One that works where the data stays in this region geographically, and data doesn't mean to be, data shouldn't be held geographically. It doesn't think that way. And so you're, you're doing extra work. So I do have a question for Sean though, while we're here. And, and, and Sean, from your perspective on the, the nationalism and the China piece, can, first, may I ask a question? Of course. <laughs> Um, Sean, like, talk about your view um, uh, on, on the sort of Pax Americana world that we've grown up in, and what we think of as the future world. Okay, and the press, the the premise is when we do scenario planning, we don't see a, a Pax Americana world in in most of the scenarios going forward. We see, you know, a Sino axis as being pretty significant, which then informs a lot of strategic decisions. Do you see it that way? Or... I think um, it's hard to answer that because I do think you're correct to not uh, think about the world uh, continuing to be uh, uh, in any other light than uh, one that will be uh, very heavily influenced by China and, and, and China's approach. But, I mean, let me answer that as a, with an example. Um, going back to the, your comment about the importance of data flows and how it 
use all kinds of nationalist policies to try to drive in the name of national security, law enforcement access, privacy, anything other than industrial policy, why you must keep your data local. Um, and of course, I think one of the lessons that's going to be learned in the 21st century uh, is the lesson that finance ministers learned in the 20th century. In the 20th century, finance ministers around the world figured out that when money stops flowing, the economy stopped growing. Uh, and so people began to understand the lesson of the 20th century, just how important money flows were uh, to an economy. I think the lesson of the 21st century is going to be that finance ministers are going to understand uh, that if we don't have data flowing in our economy, between economies, our economy is not growing. Uh, and I'm not sure when that lesson will be entirely learned, uh, but I do think uh, that those uh, economies that ultimately remain open uh, to the movement of data, uh, both within their economy and across border, uh, will see economic benefits in ways uh, that uh, other countries will not. And to that point, uh, I think that may end up being a check uh, on uh, where uh, China's influence ultimately heads, because China will never allow that uh, to happen. Uh, they've got to rely on a different model for growth. Uh, so when you ask, you know, how do we envision the world going forward? I mean, there is an opportunity with the next administration um, to kind of reset uh, the relationship with Europe. Uh, in order to deal with China, we need allies. Uh, the ability for this to be squared off as a US versus uh, China and ask the rest of the world to pick one side or the other uh, would probably be a very difficult uh, environment for us to uh, be as successful as it would otherwise be if we could bring others to the table. So my example is at the same time, we have concerns about WeChat and TikTok and where that data is stored and what that means for US citizens and privacy concerns, and somehow we wrap that up into a national security narrative. Europe has just gotten done with their highest courts saying that data transfers to the United States are not safe because of our surveillance practices. So that being said, I think these are not uh, all the same issue. Uh, there are plenty of good facts that could be discussed about how US surveillance practices uh, have plenty of checks and balances, particularly in a post Snowden world when Lots of things happen in the United States to put more controls to prevent bulk surveillance. Um, the kinds of practices that clearly do not exist in an authoritarian regime uh, like China. Um, and I think that there is an opportunity uh, for the United States and Europe, uh, who also has surveillance practices uh, in place uh, in order to protect their country and their citizen, and often, quite frankly, rely on our surveillance practices in order to root out terrorist threats that exist in Europe. Uh, to come together and have some conversations about what it means to have kind of responsible surveillance practices, how to balance that with fundamental, uh, you know, kind of rights to people's privacy uh, and come out the other side with some new global constructs. Uh, it just boggles my mind that, you know, we are together with Europe, both members of NATO, uh, but yet you cannot transfer data, at least, you know, theoretically under an EU court's decision in the United States because of concerns about US surveillance practices, but yet you can transfer data from Europe into China. And there's not a legal uh, opinion there that provides that kind of friction. Um, so I think you're right to suggest that uh, this kind of Pax Americana view, this US EU kind of access uh, to Western world. Uh, some people have referred to the Beijing consensus, Washington consensus in terms of economic models. I'm not sure, uh, that that it can be relied on going forward, but I'm not prepared to say that, that it cannot be once again reconstituted. And to your point about the importance of data flows, uh, I, I do think finally the check and balance on uh, kind of Chinese influence is ultimately one that uh, countries will wake up and realize that they need data movement in order to be economically successful. Uh, and I think that is fundamentally at odds with kind of what China needs, which is, you know, the ability uh, to control data uh, and its movement, uh, which runs counter to that kind of economic growth. That's great, John. Harvey, does that answer your question? Do you have a follow on? Do you have a rebuttal? <laughs> no. <laughs> no, thank you. Thank you for that, uh, that privilege there, Anna. Sure. We're, um, we're getting a couple questions in here on um, the types of reskilling. Um, so I'd like to reframe this a little bit for the entire panel. 
Um, so corporations are being asked to step up when it comes to preparing not only their workforce, but also filling their pipeline. Um, as these technologies like AI and cloud accelerate, we know we will just need more and more skills. Um, and as these technologies kind of work within the tasks, as Mar Marcus mentioned, within certain occupations, the tasks are kind of reorganizing between people and machines or machine learning and people. Um, tell us a little bit about if you have thoughts on what are the types of tasks or what are the types of best practices around reskilling that you've seen companies participate in and then also how what are some of the best practices for companies in ensuring that they are also looking at um, good models for diversity inclusion as well? So they're kind of two questions in one, but it's all really around best practices and what, what is the best idea or things that companies can be doing to help prepare uh, the future workforce, not only for skills, but also for better diversity inclusion. Do you have a particular order? <laughs> okay, yeah. so uh, I'll just jump in real quick. So I think in terms of best practices, I think it does have to start with the companies. I think one of the problems in the past with a lot of the reskilling, you know, or retraining programs that were instituted after say robots took over uh, car factories and, and, and similar sort of heavy manufacturing was that it was done sort of independent of what companies actually needed. And so I think it has to, I, th I guess any best practice needs to start with uh, within the companies is sort of identifying what the needs are and identifying who within that company could actually supply those needs before moving to hire uh, on the outside. And of course, you know, you have to provide incentives for companies to do this. But I think there's good examples like, uh, you know, the recently publicized retraining mod, uh, models of Accenture, the consulting firm, or Amazon, where they actually take from their existing workforce, they figure out that these, that the tasks that they need to do have changed and actually train them to do those new tasks. And I think that uh, one way to kind of ensure diversity and inclusion in this in this in this setting is to allow you know sort of provide these opportunities identify who's best for what and provide these opportunities to everybody who might be possibly affected right now of course you know for companies that don't already have a strong pipeline that may require them moving outside of their current workforces but you know by them actually examining their workforce closely and thinking about the distribution of skills and how they can be uh, put into alternative uses. I think one part of that, especially if a, a DNI initiative is coupled with that, would be to bring in some other set of of people who could fit those skill sets. I, I remember uh, reading a a book by uh, Ben Horowitz, the uh, the famous uh, VC out in Silicon Valley, and one of the things he says to ensure you know, diversity and inclusion is to hire on skill. Focus on skills and not on sort of uh, softer or more subjective areas. If you hire on skills, then if you're selecting in the right places, you'll get the right people. So I think that you know, it behooves companies to kind of really uh, you know, invest heavily in more and sort of identifying the best ways that they can use their existing human capital before uh, and, and, and through that mechanism, they can also couple that with the diversity and inclusion uh, mandate that they may have established at their company. Thanks, Marcus. Anyone else have a point of view on that? I'll just jump in on, on one perspective on it. That's a complicated question and I don't think it's that, that easy. Um, so glad it's asked, but what I've seen us do here uh, at HP is it started at a fundamental level and we do a lot of training around our growth mindset and, and really trying to get that, that mental flexibility and, and adopt a mindset that allows you to embrace new skills. And, and the reason why I think that's so important is that if you don't have a growth mindset, you're not even going to, you'll have no interest or, or capability to re even move into a new competency or skill set you won't even see that you need it you won't want it you won't desire it. it'll just be 
it'd be like teaching me a language. I'm terrible at linguistics and, and I have bad growth mindset around languages. Uh, um, so the work that we do there, that's, that's, it's constant and programmatic driven out of our, our OD um, team, our, our people team is really, really fantastic. I'd have to say, and, and you might not appreciate it. And it sounds, it, it might seem like a, um, uh, like a campaign, but, but when you strip it back, it is really important because if you're not flexible, you can't move to that next step and, and be, be um, moldable, moldable, like Marcus describes as if people are, and you're just fixed. I'll stop there. All right. Well, we ha I don't know if I can get into another question. Does anybody else have any anything to say on um, workforce diversification and de diversity inclusion? Okay. Well, I want to thank all of our panelists for joining us today. Um, this has been a lot of fun. We really appreciate it. Um, we will be uh, sending this out as a recording through our social channels at Edelman. And um, we encourage you to sign up and watch some of our future conversations um, around uh, the divide running up to the election. Thanks everyone very much. Thank you. Thank Bye -bye. you.